If anybody has a reason to sing, we do, oh we do. If anybody has a reason to sing, we do, oh we do. If anybody has a reason to sing, I want to say good evening to everyone. What a joy and a delight it is to be with you on tonight. And I trust and pray that you've had a wonderful day and that you have seen the marvelous, wonderful, good, and gracious hand of God upon your life. Because one thing I know for certain is that the Lord is good. He's not good some of the time. He is good all the time. God is a good God. And that is not anything that's debatable. It is indisputable. And so no matter what's going on in our lives, we still serve an awesome and a wonderful and a marvelous and a good God. And I trust that you have recognized that. And I trust that you have given him thanks today for all that he has done for you and for your loved ones. God is always at work. God has never ceased to work on behalf of this world, its people, and especially its children. If you are visiting with us on tonight and you're not a member of the Church of Christ at Eastside, we welcome you. We want you to know that you are indeed our honored guest. And we're thankful that you chose to tune in because we know that you have and have had and have choices. And so you chose us. And for that, we are grateful. We're grateful and we're thankful. And so we welcome you tonight. And tonight, we trust and pray that you will listen, you will learn, and that your heart will be moved to do something about your relationship with God, and that you would decide that you're going to serve the Lord, because God has been too good to you not to do so. Now, bow with me, if you will, for a word of prayer. Our God and our Father, we come to you on tonight. We first give you thanks. Thank you for every blessing, seen and unseen, known and unknown. Lord, we pray that we would never take for granted the blessings that you've given unto us. The first blessing is the blessing of life. 
And Lord, you have not only given us life, but you've given us abundant life. And Lord, we thank you for salvation. We thank you for Jesus who made salvation possible. We thank you for your great love that moved you to give him and his great love that moved him to give himself. Lord, we thank you for your Holy Spirit who lives within us, which is another demonstration of your love and the love of the Holy Spirit for us. And Lord, we thank you for your word, which reveals your heart to us and your will to us. We thank you for your church, which is your family here on earth, your kingdom here on earth, your people here on earth. You put us in family. You gave us a family, Lord, brothers and sisters in Christ. We thank you. And Lord, I thank you personally for the Church of Christ at Eastside. What a wonderful body, what a marvelous group of people that you have blessed me to be privileged to minister to. Lord, only you could have done such a thing because I know I'm not personally worthy, but I thank you, Lord, for seeing fit to allow me through your grace and mercy to minister to your people at Eastside. I ask your blessings upon them, each and every one, whoever it is tonight that might be hurting, that might be suffering from some pain or sickness or illness in their body or from death of a family member, a loved one. Lord, I ask you to be with those who are seeking employment and thank you for those who have found employment. And Lord, I pray that you would be with those who have drifted, that they might come back those who are struggling in their faith, that they might be strengthened in their faith. And Lord, I pray that you would please bless them to hear something tonight that will strengthen their hearts in your word and through your word. And Lord, we pray for this world because we know that this world is in a terrible condition. We see hatred, we see bitterness, we see division, we see fighting, we see squabbling, we see all kinds of stuff. And sometimes, Lord, over nothing. We cannot believe that we are witnessing people fight and, and even kill one another over masks. What has this world come to, Lord? Lord, help us to be more humane. Help us to find that humanity somewhere that simply says, Enough is enough. This is not the way that we should behave. Just basic human decency. Lord, I pray that somehow or another it can come back. And Father, we just pray for those poor people in Afghanistan and all of the devastation there. And we pray, God, for you to intervene because we know and we've seen and we've heard of the human atrocities that are being perpetrated against innocent people. Lord, we pray that you would intervene. We know that you are asleep. We know that you see. And so Lord, we're asking you please to step in, in your own time and in your own way. For we dare not tell you how to run your world, but we do ask Lord that you would respond according to your wisdom. Lord, be with me tonight. Guide my tongue, my thoughts. Guide my, my mind, dear Father, that I would say those things that are always consistent with your will and with your word and never teach anything that is contrary to your will. We pray that someone would decide to obey you tonight and that someone would return to you tonight and that someone would be strengthened in their faith tonight. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, tonight I'm going to be sharing with you my screen as we begin a new study. Uh, I'm going to start studying the epistle to the Romans, and I hope and pray that you have your notes. I have had them mailed out already. I trust that you have received them, and if not, I pray that you will just email me. I'm, most of you have it. I've already given it, and I will send you the notes. How did I come to decide that I'm going to teach on the book of Romans? Well, it was after much prayer, much contemplation. 
And you know that it was a struggle for me because I had my mind on perhaps going to an Old Testament book after teaching the book of Revelation. I thought about going to an Old Testament book and teaching an Old Testament book and the book of Exodus was heavily upon my heart. And I also thought about teaching the minor prophets. And, but I kept coming back to the book of Romans and there had been a request that the book of Romans be studied and taught. And so I struggled with it and I prayed about it and I decided that I would teach this book. And this is no small task because when you talk about the book of Romans, you are kind of, in a sense, talking about the Mount Everest of the New Testament epistles. And so this is a tall mountain to climb, but it is a wonderful experience to climb the mountain. And as we climb it together, I trust and pray that you will enjoy the journey. Um, there are going to be some, some difficult things in here, some thorny issues. We're not going to be getting into those tonight, but there will be some thorny issues that we'll have to tackle. We'll have to deal with, of course, free moral agency and divine election. How do these things work together, in particular, when we get to Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11? Those are going to be some tough chapters to work through as we deal with the idea of divine election, human freedom, and as we deal with predestination and foreordination and foreknowledge. So we have some, some thorny theological issues to deal with in this book, but I hope, trust, and pray that through the grace of God, we'll be able to work through them and teach what is the truth according to the word of God. I remember when I was uh, at Abilene Christian University many, many, many moons ago, and uh, I was studying the book of Romans. I was working on my undergrad degree and my professor was Dr. J.D. Thomas, who was a pretty renowned scholar there at Abilene Christian University, well known for his teaching on the books of Romans and Galatians. You had to take Romans and Galatians together. And I remember sitting in his class the first day, the first lecture, and Dr. Thomas said these words that still ring in my mind. If you get Romans, God gets you. If you get Romans, God gets you. Now, when he first made that statement, I, I kind of took it as exaggeration. I kind of took it as hyperbole. I mean, what an audacious statement to make, the audacity to think that here it is, the New Testament has 27 books, and you're saying that if I read the book of Romans, then God will, in essence, get me. What about all of the other epistles? Can I not read them and God still get me? Can I not read any combination of the other books and God get me? Well, Obviously, the answer is yes, God can do that. And yes, his word can capture our hearts no matter what book we read. But that was not his point. His point was that the book of Romans is the creme de la creme of the Pauline epistles. Romans is the most comprehensive theological exposition of the gospel that you can read about in the entire Pauline corpus of work and for that matter, the entire New Testament. There is not another book in the New Testament that gives us a more thorough explanation of God's eternal scheme of redemption than the book of Romans. So we're gonna be walking through looking at this book. And so after I completed the course on Romans and Galatians, I understood why he unapologetically stated that if you get Romans, then God gets you. Romans is indeed such a profound theological accomplishment in its systematic unfolding of God's eternal scheme of redemption 
that if one understands it, there is no logical way. I'm saying if you are seeking for truth, if you're seeking to know God and to understand God and to understand his scheme of human redemption, if you get Romans, there is no way that you can logically walk away from the gospel, from God, from Christ, if you truly understand what God has done for us, God will indeed capture your heart. Another statement that it still resonates with me that stood out in my heart relative to that class on Romans and Galatians was that he talked about the fact that the eighth chapter of the book of Romans is what he calls the diamond ring of the book. It is the diamond ring, the eighth chapter. And he says, when you look at the eighth chapter, it is the diamond ring and the 28th verse. Well, the book of Romans, I'm, I'll say it like this. He says, the book of Romans rather is the diamond ring of the New Testament. And the eighth chapter is the diamond in the ring and the 28th verse is the sparkle in the diamond. Lord have mercy, that's a beautiful statement. The, the eighth chapter, the book, of, the book of Romans is the diamond ring of the New Testament. And the eighth chapter is the diamond in the ring. And the 28th verse is the sparkle in the diamond. And we know that verse is one of those verses that we love to quote. Paul said, and we know, K-N-O-W, we know, we don't have to think, we don't have to wonder about it, guess about it, contemplate over it. We know that all things, that's everything, nothing left out of that equation. All things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. And to that I say, amen. And of course, when we get to the eighth chapter of the book of Romans, I will expound upon that more thoroughly, but suffice it to say that Paul is not saying here that everything hap that happens to us in life will be good to us. And he's not necessarily trying to say that these things aren't going to be devastating and disastrous to us, but in the grand scheme of God's plan of human redemption, and we're looking at the chapter, chapter eight of Romans, his ultimate goal is to form us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ, and bring us to glory with him. And in essence, what Paul is saying is that everything that happens in this life to us, when we give it to God, he makes it work toward that ultimate goal of creating us in the image of Jesus Christ and bringing us home to glory with him. And to that, I say, amen, praise the Lord. It helps me to look at life much differently when I understand that God didn't say that everything that would happen to me would be good, but that if I would commit it to him, he would make it work on my behalf to accomplish his ultimate goal to form us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. Therefore, after looking at all of that, I decided that I was gonna take on this monumental task of uh, studying this book of Romans and taking you through it as we study this book. We wanna look at it in, in, in a manner, and I'm not gonna just run over the verses, I'm going to try to go through it verse by verse, but I'm not going to linger because there's so much. Uh, I'm going to take it, take you through it, and I'll deal with the difficult issues. Some of those things that are just very simplistic that you automatically know. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on those, but those things that are tough, I will spend more time. And then those things that are just profound, I will definitely spend some time trying to bring those out. Because my ultimate goal is to help you as well as myself to have a better relationship with Jesus Christ, a better relationship with God in totality. I want to have that relationship that is personal and intimate. I think about Adam in the Garden of Eden 
Uh, the Bible says in the cool of the day, God came into the garden and Adam and God would walk and talk together. And of course, there's an indication that the same happened with Adam and Eve and God, that they walked and talked together in perfect harmony and fellowship with God. And that was broken by sin. But in Christ Jesus, that intimacy can be restored and has been restored. And we can have that level of intimacy with God now, whereby he walks with me and talks with me and tells me that I am his own. Lord have mercy. I thank Jesus for what he did at Calvary. And this is what we're going to be studying. The book of Romans, we're gonna see how God is going to develop this awesome scheme of redemption as we move through it. When we talk about the authorship, I think it's pretty straightforward. Uh, the author of the book of Romans is incontrovertibly and indisputably the Apostle Paul. You know, many times the form critics of the Bible will look at and try to dissect, take apart, and they question the authorship of every book in the Bible. But there are, there are those who basically have come to the conclusion that there are some books in the Bible that just simply just cannot question the authenticity of the authorship of the book. And Romans is one of those books. Romans is uh, the work of Paul's hands. He is the one who wrote this epistle in Romans chapter one and verse number one. And Paul says, uh, Paul, a bond servant, a bond servant of Jesus Christ. And when we start exegeting the text, we will look at that in detail. Called to be an apostle. We'll talk about that, what an apostle is and who the apostles were. Separated. That's another beautiful term to the gospel of God. So when I'm looking at the text, I'm looking at all of the things that can benefit and bless our lives. And there's so much right there in that text, bond servant, called, apostle, separated, gospel of God. And I'm gonna send you another paper where I'm gonna show you how that uh, next week, if it's not next week, it'll be the week after, whatever it is, after I get through this portion, I'm gonna send you another uh, paper that I did to show you how Paul in his salutation basically lays out the structure of this entire book. And so we're going to look at that. It's a, it's a lot of power in this book. The date of the authorship of this book, the date of this epistle, most writers would say, most historians would say that it was written somewhere between AD 56 and 58. Most biblical historians tend to lean toward AD 58 as verses 56 or 57. And for example, Easton's Bible Dictionary states, that, and I quote, the precise time at which it was written is not mentioned in the epistle, but it was obviously written when the apostle was about to go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. In other words, at the close of his second visit to Greece, during the winter preceding his last visit to that city. And then he gives us the passages that he believes confirms and affirms his view that it was written in AD 58. And you can look at those passages since you have them in your possession. The place of writing. Well, the place from which this epistle was written appears for certain to have been Corinth. How did I come to that conclusion? This is surmised from the following comments in Paul's greetings to the saints at Rome. Look at Romans chapter 16 and verse 23. Now, for my benefit as I teach, and for your benefit as well, I have interwoven the text into the script that you have. So you can turn in your scriptures, in your Bible and read them as well, but I have integrated them into the text that you have before you right now. Paul said in Romans chapter 16 and verse 23, Gaius, whose hospitality I and the whole church here enjoy, sends you his greetings. Now, wherever Paul was, he says, Gaius was a gracious host in extending to him his hospitality. So whenever Paul wrote this epistle, he was experiencing 
the hospitality of Gaius, and he says the church here. So he is somewhere other than in Rome because he's writing this epistle to the Romans. And so he says, where I am, I am receiving hospitality from Gaius. Well, who is Gaius? Gaius was one of Paul's converts at Corinth. Paul said in his epistles to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter, four, one, chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, he says, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. So you can just, through inductive study and deductive reasoning, understand that what happens here is that Paul is writing this epistle while he is in the home of Gaius. And the Bible tells us that Gaius was a citizen there in Corinth. So it is necessarily inferred. And there's no other way to read it other than to say that Paul was in Corinth when he wrote this epistle. Consequently, if Gaius lived in Corinth, Paul was enjoying his hospitality, and so Paul had to be in Corinth as well. Another uh, decisive point to prove that it was written from Corinth or while he was in Corinth is the fact that Paul sent the letter to the Romans by the hands of a woman named Phoebe, who was a servant in the church at Sincrea. Now, here's what you need to understand. Sincrea was a port city of Corinth or the port city of the city of Corinth. So it was the port rather of the city of Corinth. So if you pulled into the port on the east side of Corinth, the Isthmus Corinth, you were there in the area that was known as Sincrea, but it was the port to the city of Corinth. So in essence, Phoebe was from Corinth. She was from that area. And so she was the one who delivered the epistle to the church at Rome. Listen to the Bible. The Bible says in Romans chapter one, verses one and two, I commend to you, Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church in Sincrea, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her in whatever business she has need of, for indeed she has been a helper of many and of myself also. Therefore, all of the biblical evidence supports Corinth as the place of the writing of the book of Romans. Now, let me talk just a tad bit about uh, Rome and Romans, rather the people there in Rome, the saints there in Rome. The letter was written to the church at Rome. We already looked at that, Romans 1 and 1. And what's different about this is that Paul did not found or establish the church at Rome like he did many other congregations to whom he wrote. Uh, Paul did not establish this congregation, so it was not the labor of his hands or the labor of his preaching and teaching the gospel, but someone else had done it. Now, we don't know who was the founder, the one who preached, or the ones who preached the gospel to those people in Rome that led to the Church of Christ being established there in Rome. But we do have some biblical evidence as to how it might have been founded and by whom it might have been founded. And we can find that in Acts chapter 2. So you remember Acts chapter 2 is the day of Pentecost, and you remember that there were a whole lot of nations there from all over the diaspora, from all over the then known Roman world. They had come to Jerusalem for Pentecost. And so among those who came to Jerusalem for Pentecost were those who were from Rome, Jews from Rome, proselytes from Rome. And so they heard the gospel of Jesus Christ for the first time as a fact that Jesus had come, suffered, bled, and died, and was buried and rose again. The Bible says this in Acts chapter 2. Luke tells us this in Acts chapter 2, verses 5 through 10. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when 
this sound occurred, talking about the sound of the rushing mighty wind and then uh, with that followed by that, the apostles speaking in other languages. The Bible says, and when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya adjoining Syria, Syria and watch this, Serene, I'm sorry, Serene. And then he says, visitors from Rome both Jews and proselytes. So there were some there in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost when the gospel was first preached that were from Rome and also were proselytes from that area. So what do we learn here? We have Jews and those who had converted to Judaism who had come from Rome and to observe Pentecost. And while they were there, the Bible lets us know that they heard the gospel. And do you remember that in Acts chapter two, 3,000 souls were baptized into Christ on that day as the church began. So now it must be inferred that some of those, perhaps those Jews and proselytes who were there on the day of Pentecost obeyed the gospel and took that gospel message back to Rome and started the church in Rome. However it got there, we know the gospel was preached because it is the seed of the kingdom. And so wherever the seed of the kingdom is plant, planted, then it will produce fruit. So we know that the gospel was preached there by somebody and it is a possibility and that those visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, were the ones who took the gospel to Rome. Furthermore, Paul indicates that he had not seen the saints at Rome, which indicates, of course, that he was not involved in the establishment of the church at Rome. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, for I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. So we can see that Paul was not the one who established the church at Corinth, I mean, at Rome, I'm sorry. Now I wanna talk about the theme of the book. I wanna talk about the theme of the book. The primary theme of the book of Romans is found at the conclusion of Paul's rather lengthy salutation in chapter one. Paul said in that familiar verse that we so often quote in Romans chapter one, verses 16 and 17, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power, the dunamis, the dynamite of God to salvation. For everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, that in essence is the theme of the book of Romans. Paul's message to the saints at Rome was that God's grand plan to save humanity from his impending judgment and wrath is revealed in the good news of Jesus's death, burial, and resurrection, which we call the gospel. And Paul calls it that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses one through four. Listen to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses one through four. Paul says, now brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have 
taken your stand. By this gospel, by this good news, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, in other words, don't let it go, don't depart from it. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. What is it, Paul? That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried, and that he rose or he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Now I must say something about this passage because it's too much in it to pass over. Paul said, these are the facts of the gospel. When he talks about the gospel here and he talks about the death, the burial and the resurrection, that is the core of the gospel. That is like the core of an apple. Without the core, there is nothing else. It's like an axle on the wheel. Without the axle, there is no wheel. So the gospel does not just consist of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, meaning that those are the facts. But the gospel also has commandments that must be believed and obeyed. And it has blessings to be received when we obey it. And it has condemnation for those who refuse to obey it. And so when we talk about the gospel in totality, the heart and core of it is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Without that, there is no good news. And all of them are necessary. Why are they all necessary? He died, but not just died. He died for our sins. And so you need to understand this because Jesus was not the only person to ever die on the cross. Crucifixion was the Romans' means of capital punishment. Thousands of people died on crosses in Rome. In fact, when Jesus was crucified on that day, two other people were crucified with him. So crucifixion by itself does not save anyone. And Christ died on the cross, was not just a death on the cross. The Bible specifically says he died for our sins. And that's going to be great. That's going to be wonderful as we talk about this in just a few minutes. And if we don't get to it tonight, we'll get to it next week, Lord willing. But Jesus Christ died for our sins. Let us understand that. He died for you. He died for me. He died for every human being from the beginning of this world until the last person who will ever draw a breath. Jesus died for the sins of the world. So his, his death on the cross was not an ordinary death. It was a sacrifice. He died for humanity. But what do you do with dead people? You bury them. And so Paul says, Christ died for our sins. And then he says, and he was buried. He was buried. That he was buried. Well, why is that important? because Paul wants us to understand that Christ was absolutely certainly dead. All of these theories about Christ not being dead, that he just fainted on the cross, the swoon theory, that he just fainted on the cross and he was just wounded, but he was not really dead. And they put him in the grave and then he woke up inside of the tomb and then got out of the tomb. All of that's foolishness because the Bible lets us know that the Roman soldier pierced his side and out of his side came blood and water. Physicians have looked at that and said that what he died from was a ruptured heart. And so he punctured him. There was no question that Jesus was dead because the Roman soldier made certain that he was dead. And so it is um, important that we, remember, that we remember because it is a part of the gospel story that Jesus did not appear to die, he did die. He died for our sins. He took our place on that cross. Barabbas was freed. And we're represented even in Barabbas because Barabbas should have been on that cross. But instead of Barabbas, Jesus was in his place. And all of us are like Barabbas. 
We were set free by the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus who got in our place on that cross and died for us and experienced the wrath of God for us. He died and he was buried. And the Bible says, praise God, hallelujah, here is your shouting moment. He was raised on the third day. And that too was according to the scriptures. There is no salvation in just a man dying. He had to get up from the grave. Jesus said, if you destroy this temple in three days, I will raise it up again. And over and over again, as he moved toward Jerusalem and the ultimate showdown at Jerusalem with the religious leaders and moved toward the cross, Jesus said to his disciples, the son of man must go to Jerusalem. He must suffer at the hands of those religious leaders and they're going to crucify him and he's going to rise again the third day. Jesus stated that. And if that had not come to pass, then he would have proved himself to be a false prophet and there would be no salvation. So the resurrection sealed the deal. The resurrection proved beyond a doubt that Jesus was who he claimed to be and that his death was indeed vicarious. So he died on our behalf and he was buried and he rose again. And that is the gospel that Paul is preaching in Romans chapter one, when he talks about, well, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of Jesus. You got to think about that because these Romans who were concerned with power and might and glory, he says, I'm not ashamed of a crucified Messiah because that is not weakness, that is power. It is not man's power, it is God's power. Because man's power may be able to conquer nations through its military might, but God's power is able to conquer the hearts of those who have been and are being destroyed by sin. God's power is able to resurrect that life and give new meaning to life a new purpose for living. God's power is able to make the world better and to make men stop fighting against one another, hating one another, destroying each other. God's power is not a destructive power, but it is a healing power. And that's what the nation needs now, the power of the gospel. And Paul says, as I get ready, and his desire was to come to Rome, he says, well, I want you to know that I'm not ashamed of the crucified, buried, and resurrected Lord. Yes, he died. He died for me. He died for you. They buried him, and he rose again. I'm not ashamed of that marvelous message. And that's the message that I'm going to preach. You know why? Because in that message, is the righteousness of God. And we're going to look at the different ways that Paul uses righteousness in the book of Romans because it is used in the sense of how God makes man right with him, but also it is used to show how the gospel confirms his righteous nature. And so we're going to see both of those in this book. What a marvelous, marvelous thought. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God. So Paul says that the gospel has been preached and he's going to come and share this message because it is the message, listen, that saves, it is the message that saves humanity from God's impending judgment and God's impending wrath. Do you not know that if a person does not obey the gospel of Christ, that person is still under the wrath of God? And before Christ came, we were all under the wrath of God. Listen to Paul's words in Ephesians chapter 3, verses, Ephesians 5, verses 3 through 7. But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality 
or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, of coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure. No immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. And friends, what that tells us is that God's wrath is not just waiting till the end of time, that is his ultimate wrath. But even now, those who are in rebellion to God can and do receive punishment for their sins and the wrath of God is revealed even now. But the ultimate wrath of God, but it's, it's now revealed with restraint. But at the end of time, it will be revealed without restraint. Listen to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8 through 10. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, listen, who rescues us from the coming wrath. So Jesus Christ has rescued us. You see, I don't fear the second coming of Jesus. I look forward to the second coming of Jesus. I don't fear God. I don't fear going to hell because Jesus rescued me from that. And friends, if you are living in fear of hell, then there must be something wrong with your relationship with God. There must be something wrong with your relationship with Christ because Christ Jesus rescues us from the coming wrath of God. So we don't live in fear. We live in joy and happiness and peace, not fear and dread. And so friends, if your life is not right with God, you need to get it right. If you walked away and, and you're wondering about how can I come back, you need to come back. Because in Christ, we have been rescued from the coming wrath. It will not touch us. Just like the death angel, when the death angel saw the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of the houses in Egypt and on the lintels of the houses in Egypt, the Bible says that when the angel saw the blood, that it leaped over, that it passed over those houses. In other words, death did not touch them because they were covered by the blood. And I'm saying we are covered by the ultimate blood of the ultimate Lamb of God. And God's death will not touch us. His wrath will not touch us because we belong to him and we are covered. So get out of fear and get into joy. Get into peace. Get into happiness because that's what God has done for us in Christ Jesus. Listen to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 now. Verses 4 through 11, but you, brothers, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you when, like a thief, talking about the coming of Christ. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us use, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not notice, for God did not appoint us to suffer wrath 
but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or sleep, dead or alive, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. Did you hear what he said? Did you, do you see how he connects the death of Christ his sacrifice on the cross with our deliverance from the wrath of God. And so ladies and gentlemen, I thank God for the gospel. And no wonder Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. And immediately after he says that, after he talks about the gospel in Romans 1, 16 and 17, in verse number 18, he says, but the wrath of God abides on those, in essence, who will not obey the gospel, who will not listen to the word of God. So friends, I thank God for the gospel. I don't have to fear. I don't have to live in fear. I don't have to live in doubt because... I have been redeemed. I've been saved by the blood of the lamb and God sees the blood and he says, no wrath can touch you because Jesus died for our sins. Now, let me try to wrap this up as I bring this to a conclusion here. The death of Christ on the cross satisfied God's righteous character, whereby he provided himself with a sacrifice for our sins so that we could escape his wrath against sinners and against sin and against sinners. Jesus's death on the cross atoned for our sins. His death expiated that is atoned for, that is paid for our sin debt. Let me state it like this. His death wiped out our debt. What a blessing that is. His death wiped out, nullified, did away with our debt that we owed God for sinning against him that was so humongous that we could never pay it. It was so astronomical that it took God in the person of Christ to pay the price. Lord have mercy. Nevertheless, only those who are willing to accept his death on their behalf and believe that Jesus died for your sins. Believe that he was buried. Believe that he rose again. Only those who hear that message and believe that message and embrace that message and then repent of their sins, confess Christ, and then render obedience to him in baptism. Only those can escape and will escape the wrath of God. Paul states that this message of salvation by means of faith in the atoning death of Christ is available to all Jews and Gentiles alike by means of a system that's predicated on faith and not on works. Praise the Lord. You can never work your way to heaven. You simply cannot do it. You don't have enough time. You don't have enough lifetimes. And if you had a trillion, you never could do it because it took God to do for us what we could never do for ourselves. That's why I love him so much. I don't know about you, but I love the Lord for what he has done for me. The sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the power of God to save humanity through the gospel, that is the overarching theme of the book of Romans. It is a book that extols the salvific work of Christ on the cross for our sins and for the sins of humanity. 
No matter the race, thank God for that. No matter the ethnicity, thank God for that. No matter the social standing, thank God for that. No matter the economic standing, thank God for that. And no matter your political persuasion, thank God for that. Anyone who wants to be saved can be saved. No one has to earn salvation and no one can earn salvation. It is the gift of God, Ephesians chapter two, verses eight and nine. Now, let me take this brief excursion apart from uh, my text for a moment. I'm still going to talk about what I'm talking about. This is how I want to end it tonight. And that is upon the fact that I've talked about the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross to appease God or to pay a debt. And some people don't like that idea. Let me say a word concerning the idea of expiation and propitiation. Some people dislike this image, an idea of propitiation because of the paganistic concept of sinners seeking to appease an angry deity. But this is nothing like the paganistic idea where God is angry with the sinner and the sinner has to offer a sacrifice to appease God's anger so that they can now be at peace with God and God be at peace with them. What God did is nothing like paganism. Expiation has to do with removing our guilt through offering a payment or an atonement for the guilt. That's why we talk about redemption, paying to get us out of something. So when we talk about expiation, Christ was the payment and Christ was the offering. The idea of propitiation is similar except for in it is the idea that God's justice and God's wrath are satisfied. And thus his hostility toward the sinner is removed. So let me put it like this. God offers Jesus as the payment for our sins. In other words, he expiates. He is the expiation. He is the sin offering. He covers, he pays the debt. And Jesus satisfies at the same time. He propitiates. God's wrath against the sinner. So therefore God's hostility is removed from us by the death of Christ and now he can be at peace and we can be at peace with him because of what Christ did for us at the cross on our behalf. So both ideas of expiation and propitiation is in that offering of Jesus Christ. Christ paid the cause for our sins, expiation, but he also took our place and became our substitute that received the wrath of God that appeased and satisfied his wrath and anger against the sinner. What's the difference? Here it is. The enormous difference between paganistic beliefs and Christianity is that God is the one who is offended but he is also the one who provides the sacrifice for the offenders, hallelujah. The offended goes out and gets what's necessary to not be offended against those who offended him. Therefore, God's scheme of redemption is nothing like paganism. Pagans had to bring their deity and offering to appease his anger with them. So the pagan had to choose and offer the sacrifice. However, it is absolutely the opposite when it comes to Christianity. God, who is the offended one, does not require of us, the offenders, to offer a sacrifice for our sins. On the contrary, God, the offended one, selects his own sacrifice and that sacrifice was Jesus and offers his own sacrifice whom he chose and he offered him to himself. 
By doing this, he satisfied his righteous indignation against sin and appeased his wrath, which is consistent with his righteous character, thus remaining a righteous God who punishes sin and the sinner gets off. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Don't you see it? Don't you see it? Don't you see it? God did for us what we could never do for ourselves. He fixed it like we could never fix it. He paid for our sins. He punished the sinner at the same time, and he let the sinner go free because of what Christ did. Listen to Isaiah 53, 5 through 10 as we close. He says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions, transgression of my people, he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, Yet watch this now, here it comes, here comes expiation and propitiation. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him. Who crushed him? The Lord crushed him on that cross. He allowed it to be. Yes, it was through the hands of wicked men through their own choosing, but God used that to bring about our salvation. He used their meanness and their hatred to bring about his ultimate will. The Bible says, Yes, it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And through, and though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he made his life a guilt offering. That substitutionary sacrifice, that is expiation, that is propitiation. He will see his offspring and prolong his days. And he will, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his, prosper in his hands. Isaiah clearly said that it was the Lord who offered Christ and it was the Lord who crushed him on our behalf. We did not appease or satisfy God's wrath. God satisfied his own wrath by the offering of his own son on the cross for us. We did not offer God anything to cover our sins or to atone for our sins. On the contrary, all we had to do was to accept the atoning sacrifice of Christ and on the basis of grace and faith, which responds in obedience, we are saved. And the church says, amen. Thank you for listening. I pray that you got something from that. If that doesn't move you, nothing will. This is what God did for us. I love that thought. The offended said, I'm going to, pay the debt, of the, one, the debt of the one who offended me so that I can be on good terms with him and he be on good terms with me. What a God we serve, church. Who wouldn't want to serve a God like that? If you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and rose again, will you repent of your sins? Will you confess Christ? Will you be baptized in water for the remission of your sins? Get in touch with us at the Church of Christ at East Side. We will be glad to assist you in your obedience to Christ. God bless you and have a wonderful and blessed night.